smiling faces that made it here today. Uh, today we're going to be looking at chapter 7 of the book of Revelation and in chapter 14. Uh, chapter 7 is about two groups of people, very different groups of people. Chapter 14 is a continuation of something about the first group, the 144,000 Jewish people who are sealed. And we'll take a look at that group of people today and, and the others next time. Uh, just to recap, the judgments have begun to come from heaven when we get to chapter 7. Chapter 6 involves the opening of seals and the troubles and problems that come to the earth as a result of that. At the end of chapter 6, six of the seven seals have been opened, and then chapter 7 is like an interruption to that, or a sideline, or like if we were telling a story about things here on the earth, we might talk about, now this was going on, but meanwhile, back over here at this other place, this is what was happening. So the narrative of the seals being opened has stopped, and we're given this information about these two groups of people, the 144,000 and a great company of other people out of all nations and tongues and peoples of the earth. So looking at it in that way, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, that is the first six seals having been opened and the things that happened because they were opened, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. And one thing I love about the scriptures, and in a way it seems redundant, why could he not just have said 12,000 from each tribe? Because he accounts each and every one of them and each and every one of us worthy of his distinct attention. Every single one of us matters to him. It wasn't just the tribes of Israel. It was the individual tribes. Lord knows us. The Bible says that he's numbered the hairs on our head. Some of us are less troubled to him in that respect than others. But it's a, it, the meaning of it was how intimately he knows us and is concerned about us so when you come to something in the bible like this passage and the first and second chronicles of the old testament and you got endless genealogies and sons of and begats and uh, it's just another example of how the lord pays individual attention to every single one of us so look over at chapter 14 where we once again find 144,000. And it does not say specifically that these are the same people. There's quite a bit of reason to assume that it is the same group of people. But by the time we get to chapter 14, their circumstances have changed. So chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads, 
And I heard a voice from his heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I had the, heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So in verse 6, he's moved on to something else. Would you think it would be reasonable to assume that it's the same 144,000 people? Probably so, but it does not say that. So let's ask the Lord's blessings. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have to be here today, gathered in your presence. Father, that we ask that you'd be among us and that you'd open the scriptures to our understanding, that you'd help us, Lord, to comprehend this, to divide it properly, to apply it to our lives in a way that would be pleasing to you. Guide our thoughts and our steps, and we ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So, I'd like you to notice a couple of things about the 144,000. In particular, that it's not exactly the same 12 tribes of Israel that you find listed in the book of Genesis, and they are not in the order in which they were born. Reuben was the firstborn, but not the first mentioned here. Dan is not mentioned here at all. But Manasseh, who is one of Joseph's sons, is mentioned in his place. And there's all kinds of speculation about why was Dan left out. Well, it doesn't mean Dan was left out of anything because those who belong to God belong to him on an individual basis, not a tribal basis. This was for a specific purpose and, you know, just because God doesn't include everyone in a specific ministry or a specific group of people or for a specific specific purpose doesn't indicate that he's left anyone out of anything. Always, always, always there are levels of meaning and understanding. And I'd like to point out to you the fact that they are said to have a song in chapter 14. And if you go back to the original text where Jacob and his, his wives and concubines begin to have children, the Old Testament names have meaning. Uh, and the meaning of those names tell us something. The Bible says that no one but the 144,000 could know that song. Well, it's kind of like we all know the words to Amazing Grace, and most of us love Amazing Grace. But we cannot know Amazing Grace in the way that John Newton, who wrote the song, knows Amazing Grace. One of my favorite songs, It Is Well With My Soul. If you know the story of Horatio Spafford and the loss of all of his family except his wife, for him to have said, It Is Well With My Soul, and written that song, is marvelous. And I love the song, and I know the words to the song, but I don't know the song the way Horatio Spafford knew that song. I can turn to Exodus chapter 15, and I can read the Song of Solomon, but I will never know the Song of Solomon in the way that the Israelites who walked on dry land under the Red Sea with the water stacked up on either side of them can know that song. I can't know the Song of Mary that's recorded in Luke chapter 1. Or the song of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, who's also recorded in Luke chapter 1. And it's not recorded like a song that we would see with verse and, uh, and, and everything, and music with it. But it's a, it's, a, it's a praise from their heart. And it's a, it's a picture of the song in your heart that you have when the relationship between you and your Savior is right. 
So these people have a song. And we can know some about that song, but not what they know. Because they're individuals like we're individuals. And they're in a different set of circumstances. Each one of us has a private relationship and a private life and existence before God that no one else can ever completely comprehend. So what do we know about this song? We can learn quite a bit about what that song might say if we go back to Genesis and look at the names and the meaning of the names. And there was quite a bit of contention in the household of Jacob between his two wives and the handmaidens of the two wives whom they gave to him as concubines. The first of our child was Leah, and the firstborn was Reuben. But Reuben is not who appears first in this listing. Dan doesn't appear at all, and the meaning or the reason why the name Dan does not appear here could very well be because of what his name actually means. The meaning of the word Dan, the name Dan of the Old Testament, had to do with judge, judgment, with strife in the courts, with suing and carrying on <coughs> in courts like that, and judgment, and that has no place in the song of people who are standing in the presence of God as these people were on Mount Zion, they're with the Lamb and they're singing before the throne their song of praise. And judgment has no place there. So the first to be mentioned is Judah. The name Judah simply means, now will I praise the Lord. It's a, <coughs> it's a word that has to do with celebration. And what was in Leah's heart when she had Judah, was to celebrate. That was about the fourth son for, for Leah. And she's joyous over having had another son. The second <coughs> mentioned is Reuben. And the meaning of the word Reuben, of the name Reuben, is surely the Lord has looked on my affliction. And it also has a secondary meaning of see ye a son. That's the strong, exhaustive, concordance definition of the word Reuben. Look, behold a son. And her interpretation of it, her meaning was, look, I've got a son. God has smiled on me. Okay? Gad is the next one, which means a troop is coming. It is a phrase or a term that you would use for an invasion. A great company of people. It's an exaggeration because that's only in their natural order, I think, son number five. But five sons can seem like a great company or a troop and an invasion. But that's the meaning of the word. Asher is next. Happy am I, for the daughter <coughs> shall call me blessed. And the contention between the wives and the concubines was very real, but the meaning of the word is, now I'm blessed. I will be called blessed. I'm happy. And, and the, the Hebrew meaning of the word is to be in a proper orientation. Everything is level and straight and correct, meaning my relationship before God is as it should be. And the joy that comes from that <coughs> is very real. The name meant that this person was feeling very, very content with their circumstances. Now I've arrived in, uh, we might say, a happy place. Naphtali. With great wrestling have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. Now, we don't have to worry about uh, wrestling with our sisters. Most of us are well past that in years. But we have troubles and struggles, things that we wrestle with, and the inference here is that my troubles are past now because of all the sons, and I'm going to bring joy to Jacob, my husband, and to my family because of what the Lord has given me. So, I've had troubles and struggles and tribulations, but now they're over. Manasseh. Manasseh is not a son of Jacob. Manasseh is a son of Joseph, grandson to Jacob. He's mentioned in the place of Dan so that we have 12 tribes. But in the place of Dan, we have Joseph's son Manasseh. And that's in keeping with a thing, a principle in the Old Testament about the double portion. 
The double portion in a family of means one son, usually the eldest son, when the family wealth was to be distributed, would get a double portion, twice as much as anyone else. And it was not because he was more deserving, not because he was singled out to be the object of Father's love more than anyone else. It was so that it would be an extra portion with which it could be kept in store for a time when the family had great need. It was to be a steward over the family to have a means there for when someone got in trouble. Remember the story of Elisha and Elijah when Elijah was fixing to go up in the chariot? Elijah told him to ask what you will of God. And if you see me leave, you'll get it. Well, he stayed right there with him till he left in the chariot. What he asked for was a double portion. And we might think, okay, he wants a double portion of Elijah's grace, so he wants to be bigger and greater than Elijah. No, he asked to be the prophet over the nation of Israel, the steward over, the servant of, the minister to the nation of Israel. He wasn't asking for more for himself. He was asking for a position of being a minister to and having God to use him as an instrument of blessings to Israel. God used Joseph as an instrument of blessings to the nation of Israel when he sent him as a servant, as a slave into Egypt, ahead of the family by decades. And by the time they arrived, he second only to Pharaoh in the land. So that Joseph pictures the, the double portion. He was placed in a position where he could be a minister to and a protector of and a steward over the house of Israel. So when these people arrive here, it's in keeping with that concept that there's a portion for Joseph, but also a portion for one of his sons, Manasseh, the double portion. Manasseh means that I forget all my toil, causing to forget. Simeon, because God hath heard that I was hated, and he hath therefore given me this son also. So, God heard was the point of that. God heard what was going on with me. He knew my afflictions and troubles. He listened to me. Hagar said the same thing of God when she was fleeing from Abraham and from Sarah. God heard me. God hears us. What a wonderful thought, you know, the creator of all of this. Here's us. Levi, now this time will my husband be joined unto me, attached to be twined together. And at the time of this, these people are joined together with their Savior. It said they were on Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a term that means Jerusalem, but it has a dual meaning because it sometimes means Jerusalem, the physical place, but Jerusalem with its heavenly connection. And they are with the Lamb on Zion, and then they are singing before the throne of God. So it has to do with uh, being with our husband. Christ is pictured as the bride and the church as his bridegroom. They're pictured in this relationship with him. So Isaac is next. God hath given me my hire. Or the strong meaning is he will bring a reward. In other words, for having chosen the Lord Jesus Christ as their life. Then they become, remember back in the first part of the book, chapter 2 and 3, where in each of the letters to the churches, there was a phrase about overcomers, to him that overcometh. These people are overcomers. They're overcomers because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ who overcame the world. And now they have received their reward. They're with him. Zebulon, to reside or to dwell with, to enclose. Now my husband will dwell with me. It's what the mother said in naming the son. Now I'm going to be with my Lord, is the picture of that. Joseph, God hath taken away my reproach. God has taken away our reproach, y'all. 
But we don't have a sense of that, not like we're going to have when we're in His presence. And the physical nature which is with us today is no longer with us. And the sin nature is gone and our reproach is completely gone. That's what these people were experiencing in chapter 14. They're with Him. The joy of their heavenly existence is brand new to them. So did they have a song to sing? You bet. And finally, Benjamin. And y'all, this is one of the sweetest of all the names. Benjamin means the son of my right hand. Jesus is referred to severally as the being seated at the right hand, as being standing at the right hand. In other places, he is S-E-T said as in being placed at the right hand. And in the Psalms, even, it's inferred that he is the right hand of God. But that wasn't first what he was called. His mother died in childbirth, and she named him Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. Can you imagine Mary's perspective of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ? She knew that he was special. She knew that he was from God and that he had a purpose for God and that it was above our human comprehension what was going to happen. But can you imagine the mother's heart to stand there and watch him being crucified? Son of my sorrows from the mother's perspective, but the son of my right hand from the father's perspective. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, if you take that and you condense it a little bit, you come up with something that goes kind of like this. Now will I praise the Lord. Behold a son. A great company is coming. Happy am I, for I will be called blessed. My wrestlings are over and I have prevailed. God has caused me to forget. The Lord has heard me. Now will my husband be united with me, or will my Lord be united with me? God hath given me my hire, and it's not talking about salvation, but my reward. God has taken away my reproach and will add yet more to me. My sorrow is changed, and the son of sorrows has become the son of the right hand. Now, if we do a little bit of <coughs> changing the grammar around and add some punctuation it might sound something like this now let us praise God for behold the son of God by him ourselves and a great company are coming to this place where we will be called happy and blessed for our struggles and our travails in this earthly life are over and we have prevailed by the Lamb of God God has caused us to forget the toil of our earthly life for he heard our cries and now are we united with our Lord. God has given us our reward and has taken away our reproach and will add yet more to us. Jesus, who was the son of sorrows, has become the son of the Father's right hand. That's something like the song of the 144,000 when they stand in His presence. And they get a special moment in time when no one else is in focus. And they're they're taken kind of like the first fruits out of the time of the tribulations before the great tribulation comes upon the earth. They're sealed. And sometime between that and the end of the great tribulation, then they're taken from this place and they stand in the presence of God. A lot of people think that they're going to be evangelists and that they're going to be martyred. The Bible doesn't say that. That may be what happens. There's another train of thought that thinks that they're going to be preserved through the tribulation and that they'll be here to live in the millennial kingdom. But I don't think so because in chapter 14 they're with the Lord and they're standing before the throne to sing. They're taken out of tribulation ahead of time like a first fruits. Like Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, the first fruits of them that slept. Pictured by the, the feast of first fruits in the Old Testament during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, during that week-long period, whenever during that week the first day of the week came, then the first of the harvest they brought to the priest to offer. And later on, after 
seven weeks plus the, the first day of the week once again, 49 days for seven weeks, plus the first day of the next week, Pentecost, means 50. The, the week of the, of the Feast of the Harvest. It was no accident that during the week of unleavened bread, Christ rose from the grave on the first day of the week, which was the very day that Israel celebrated the Feast of First Fruits. And it was no accident that on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon the church and empowered them with the commission to go and preach the gospel to the world. So it is not unusual to think that there's a first fruits out of the tribulation time. When before the end of the tribulation, God calls a group of people away to be with Him. And there's horrible times coming. And did you notice that when we read about them, that the angels which have control of the wind, and the wind is a picture there of destruction that's coming. The first six seals, first four had to do with the political structure being turned all upside down and evil becoming in control completely. And the fifth seal had to do with the martyrdom of people for the name of Jesus Christ. And the sixth seal, there's things begin to happen to the earth that are the hand of God. But before the seventh seal is opened, then while the angels are holding back the winds of change and destruction, before the horrible things that are coming can happen to the earth, God calls a moment to hold and to seal these people, to bring attention to them, that these are set aside for my purpose. And in chapter 14, we see that they're with Him, but like a first fruit, out of those who come out of the tribulation time. So, the song of the 144,000. No one can know that song but we can know a little bit about it. We can understand part of it, just like I can understand it as well with my soul, but I don't ever expect to comprehend it to the depths of the man who wrote that song. God gave that to him, and he shared it with us. God gave this special song to the 144,000, but we can know part of it. We can know the concept. We can know it because there are similarities between their salvation and our salvation. We're going to be with the Lord in glory too. Circumstances are a little different. But we have enough common ground to understand what kind of song is going to be sung in the presence of God by the redeemed of the earth. And these are a special group of people, but they are still, as you and I will be, as you and I are today, the redeemed of the earth. So oh, the song of the 144,000 God. Uh, next week we'll get to the multitude out of all nations and peoples and tongues. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Brother Tim will have a message for you in a little while, and next week we'll have another lesson out of uh, Revelation about the same time. God bless and keep you.